housekeeping information. So we just ask that microphones are off, your video on or off, it's up to you. Of course, we'd love to see everybody. And uh, if what we're gonna do is ask for questions in the chat feature and Bakari will monitor that, but we can always play that by ear as well after uh, Dr. Childers starts to talk and, and uh, we'll just follow her lead. The session is being recorded so that we can put the video up and the transcript in order to make it accessible on the Qualab uh, web pages. And if you need closed captioning for future events, the national ones will automatically be closed captioned, but this one can be if we get a little heads up, we can certainly do that. Of course, check out the websites for more information on exciting events. So I already said uh, the housekeeping bit of information, but I wanted to quickly introduce myself and then I'll hand it over to Bakari. So I'm Dr. Penny Pasquay and I'm a professor in educational studies as well as the director of the Qual Lab. I've been here for one year and am excited to just continue the work and build the uh, Qual Lab through the college. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Bakari and he will introduce himself as well as Dr. Childers. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Bakari Lamumba. I am the graduate research assistant for the qualitative research lab here at the Ohio State University. I'll be introducing Dr. Sarah M. Childers. She is the director of strategic diversity planning, training and assessment for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at the Ohio State University. Prior to stepping into this position, she was the assistant director for the Women's Place at Ohio State. After completing her doctorate in 2010, she became a faculty member at the University of Alabama before returning to Ohio to teach. She has taught qualitative research for over 10 years, and her research has focused the relations between race and educational policy, access, and opportunity for students in K-12 schools. Her book, Urban Educational Identity, Seeing Students on Their Own Terms, has been awarded the 2017 Critics' Choice Book awarded by, awarded by AESA and the 2017 O.L. Davis Distinguished Book Award. Please help me welcome Dr. Sarah M. Childers. Is it my turn now? Thanks. Yes, I'll stop sharing and then just that way everybody can see each other. Yeah, so um, I know folks kind of came in fluidly. I'm, I'm not sharing a... Um, PowerPoint presentation, I'm just going to kind of work off, um, I'm just going to talk and I'm going to work a little bit off a of paper um, that I gave at AESA, la I think last year. Um, and just for the sake of transparency, um, I'm probably a little less prepared than I would have been. My father passed away last week, so I'm just returning from, you know, being with family and all of that, so. Um, I appreciate your patience with me, but I think we'll still have a really good conversation. So I'm gonna get started. Um, Bakari already did a, an introduction for me. I work as the director, oh, thank you, Penny. I work as the director um, of strategic diversity planning, training and assessment for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I've been in ODI since I returned to Ohio State in 2016. Uh, working at the Women's Place and then uh, moving into this position. I'm also currently the coordinator for the um, Task Force on Racism and Racial Inequities, and I serve on the Senate Diversity Council. So um, as an administrator, I've got my hands in a lot more pots than I would have had as a faculty member. And so some of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm kind of going to split my conversation uh, between um, talking about my research um, and the role of whiteness in research and then looking at also, there's the dog, uh, whiteness from the perspective of administration. Um, so I kind of started thinking about, well, where was whiteness in my research? So in 2008, I began a two year ethnographic case study of a, a local high school um, that was categorized as a high achieving, high poverty high school here in central Ohio. It was 65% um, black students, about 2% Latinx students, and then the remainder was white um, students from the APIDA community, refugee community. Um, and the school mimicked the demographic breakdown of Columbus City Schools at the time. So this is 2008, two year ethnographic case study. 
Um, this was before Robin DiAngelo, Ken DXA, you know, this is before um, the kinds of conversations that we're having now. Um, so what was holding my feet to the fire in terms of doing this work was critical race theory, um, which is highly conceptual. It's more in the academy. Um, and so this lexicon that we have now in, um, you know, in, almost in a pop culture kind of way that's getting so much import uh, wasn't something that existed in the past. And I kind of, I don't talk about it right now, but I do think about like what would be different if I had access to this kind of work. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, critical race theory, feminist scholars of color, I come out of women's studies. Um, you know, my close colleagues and, you know, my students are sort of what held me accountable in doing work that interrogated race, but also thought really intentionally about the role that my whiteness played in doing that research. Um, initially, I started this study as a policy analysis because I was actually very concerned about what it meant for a white researcher to come in to do research on race, like what kind of violence can you perpetuate? What are the gaps in understanding where you would um, further these like deficit discourses? So I was very almost, I would say, paralyzed to the point where I started thinking, well, I'm just going to look at policy. <clears throat> I was really interested in the way policy was practiced in the school. So, and I, I've always been fascinated by ethnography. And that's, um, I really discovered that I couldn't see a way of doing that looking at policy as practice without physically being, you know, in the setting doing research. Um, but again, very concerned about what that, how, how was that going to play out? Um, what was my level of accountability? Um, it was also immediately apparent that I couldn't just look at policy um, and look away from the way racism, discrimination, and oppression was perpetuated within this school that had a really stunning um, reputation. You know, so 99% of their students typically were graduating every year and that significant portion of them were going on to higher education, um, including, you know, Harvard's Princeton, you know, Ivy's, you know, Ohio State, some pretty, pretty good state schools, you know, and also a significant portion of them were going to Columbus State. But this kind of achievement stood in stark contrast to what was happening in Columbus City Schools at the time, a school, a school system that was failing, right? Um, I think about 60 some percent of students were graduating, maybe 70%, right? So what was it about, why was this school with the same kinds of students, why was this school able to be so successful, so extraordinarily successful when the other schools were really struggling? So that's what got me interested in being there. Um, but it was immediately apparent that this was a more complicated picture, right? Success was actually hinged on deficit discourses. Um, and so I couldn't just look away and look at policy. Um, I came to terms with the fact that that would actually be another kind of ethical betrayal, you know. Um, and now we talk a lot about the ways in which, you know, one of the ways white privilege functions is the ability to look away. Um, I'm not sure that that was something we really talked about then, but I think I recognized that, you know, looking away was its own, was its own kind of violence, right? So it was important for me to, to try to find a way to tell that story as ethically as possible. Um, so looking at the intersections of the way race and policy and student identity uh, were implicated and what were the limits and the possibilities of this intersection, right? Because part of what was so important was that this school was successful, but also what are the consequences of sort of leveraging these discourses for that success? Um, so as success was entangled with practices of racial and socioeconomic inequity. So one of the things, and this is consistent in all the literature, um, one of the things we saw in that school was um, unequal opportunities along lines of race and class. So IB courses were continued to be predominantly white, AB, AP courses were a little bit more um, had more students of color in them, but most students of color were over comp over concentrated in the what they called the basic academic track. And so 
that's not publicly apparent, but it's an internal structure um, hinged on, you know, racial and racial inequity, racial discourses, um, and that was important to our kind of look at. Um, this was a, a, a school that received a lot of national awards and accolades. Um, so I wanted to look at how that award status was hinged on these deficit discourses. Like, what gets you an award is the surprise, right? The surprise of students of color doing well. Um, that's problematic. So how do we talk about that within the lens of, of whiteness? And then the challenge was also just how to tell, you know, a complicated story, how to foreground the, the experiences and the agency of the students in this school, um, be attentive to the, the way my whiteness was going to shape that, the role it would play in terms of um, the relationships I built with those students. Um, and then also one of my concerns was not over theorizing to the point where no one could understand what I was talking about. So that was, um, and as I translated this dissertation to a book, that was one of the things I really focused on was uh, the, the accessibility of it. Though the theory really informed the way I did the work, the way I analyzed the work, the way I thought about it, um, it was important to me that it was, that theory was kind of woven in in a way that wasn't inaccessible to anybody who would choose to read it. Let me flip the page here. Um, so in the book, there are chapters where I look at whiteness and white privilege. Um, I look how it operated in the school, how um, white families and um, even families of color leverage the perception of a Title I school uh, to get their students better better colleges, better um, scholarships. So, um, and in particular, how white families kind of, particularly those that were liberal and middle class kind of kind of use this to kind of feel good about themselves, right? So part of their white, nar the, their narrative as white liberals was that they let their children, let their children go to school with these other children, right? And so, a lot of, at back then, a lot of people weren't really considering what was prob. We weren't really talking about the problematics of that, right? We weren't really looking at schools with this kind of um, demographic breakdown, but there aren't also a lot of schools that are high achieving and identified as high achieving and high poverty. Um, so how, how did, um, how did sort of this landscape really provide students opportunities, but also like what were the consequences of it. Um, there were some extraordinary teachers in this school that provided a different uh, definition of success. Um, and it, they allowed me to think about what it meant to work with students on their own terms, which is sort of the, one of the, is sort of the subtitle of the book, um, seeing students on their own terms. So how are these students in this school agents of their own success. One of the problems with the school was they, uh, you know, in the, in the race for awards and grants and supports, uh, they took all the credit for these students, right, their successes and achievements. But if you really dug deeper, uh, what you see is students um, who are just dedicated their to their own success, even in, in spite of some who were really in some um, struggling circumstances. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say about the book was the ways in which my whiteness was an asset, which is not something I thought about um, when I was writing it. Um, you know, I could leverage my whiteness to talk to other white people. Uh, they would talk to me about things in hushed tones, thinking that I was on the same page with them. Um, I could pretend that I was on the same page with them. You know, part of the work of qualitative research is, is getting people to be forthcoming with you. Um, and so they're white, I'm white. Maybe my politics and understanding of whiteness are different from theirs. But for me, it was important to understand their perspectives and their practices, uh, even if they were disappointing, right? So we have to kind of, um, as researchers, I think, create an open 
a space where people can share with us even like the worst parts of things because um, we can't understand those things unless people share them with us and part of doing that work is having to suspend judgment sometimes and that can be hard um, but that is kind of for me what the work was it was about creating a space where people could really share what what they were doing what was going on how they saw the world um, because otherwise we don't know. And then the last thing I'll say, you know, that um, my whiteness allowed me to come back and talk with them. So I did um, three member checks the second year of my study. And, you know, the staff's predominantly white. One of the assistant principals was white. Uh, a lot of the parents that talked, not all of them, but a lot of the parents that spoke with me were white. And I could talk back to them about their race talk. I could talk about racialized practices probably in a different way or be, I would say be heard in a different way, right? Than a scholar of color might've been heard. Um, and I felt like that, now that I look back on it, I feel like that was probably an advantage of my whiteness that someone else might've, may or may not have been able to capitalize on. Um, you know, the question is, did things change? And they, they started to, um, I had spoken with the principal and she talked to me about some programmatic things she was doing to try to um, get students up into the higher, the AP and IB classes, try to redistribute, right? That makes some changes in her faculty. Um, it was really a lot about culture shaping, I think, but also address, and again, like if you think back to 2008, 2009, 2010, we weren't, ha we, these conversations, we weren't having them. The way we're having them right now, post George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, the fact that we've got a president saying we need to be an anti-racist university, we wouldn't have heard that 10 years ago, right? And I, some of that I think has to be, it has to do with generational um, understanding of like how you talk about race. Um, we could talk about that later. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about um, whiteness and administration and what it means to work in the space of diversity and inclusion. Um, so how has whiteness shaped my work as an administrator? So I'm going to share some pieces of a paper that I was asked to um, write. I was invited to participate on a panel about, um, it was called White Trash in the Academy. And so folks that don't know, I'm from West Virginia. You'll kind of hear a little bit about my upbringing um, in here. So I'm just gonna read from this. Um, so I work in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I'm one of a handful of white folks in an organization of around 80. Uh, when I shared the title of my session with a, a very close colleague and my, the senior leader I report to, their mouths dropped, their eyes got really wide, you know, a little bit of nervous laughter. My friend said that as a black woman, she would never refer to herself by a pejorative like that. And why would I want to refer to myself as white trash, which she saw as equivalent. I don't. We could talk about that. Uh, she was curious about how my white identity intersected with my work. Um, she said, you're supposed to be, these are her words, you're supposed to be a racist. And by that, I think she meant a real overt kind of stereotypical stereotypical kind of white Southern racist. Uh, but you work for ODI, how did that happen? So as I wrestled with this paper, <clears throat> one of my concerns was how to negotiate the inevitable white centering that would occur when talking about racial solidarity from the pers perspective of a stigma stigmatized white identity, which is what a white trash identity is. I'm not even sure that you can reconcile that tension or that you should, but it should be addressed. Uh, my friend's question then serves as a jumping off point. So beyond white centering, what are the tensions in talking about white identity in the academy as it relates to other racial political projects? Um, what's at stake? What's at stake in these conversations? Uh, what possibilities are available, but also what possibilities do we foreclose if we don't look at white identity and white solidarity? Um, so then I go on in the paper to kind of interrogate what is this sort of white trash imaginary? What's the cross hatching of whiteness and class? 
um, and then how stratified white identities within white culture get produced. And the reason why I talk about that is because my relation to whiteness is from growing up in Northern West Virginia, which is um, extremely white, like hom homogenizing, you, uh, very, very few people of color where I live, very, very few, a very, very small number of black students in my school. Um, so my relationality of whiteness wasn't um, necessarily in relation to um, other people of color. My relationality and whiteness was stratified by my class relations within whiteness, uh, which gives you kind of, it, it looks a little different. Um, <clears throat> so the next section of this paper is called the problem of white trash. So the problem with a white trash identity is it's irreconcilability. It's an oxymoron built on white supremacy. It's simultaneously a demeaning slur to whites, but it's also a backhanded insult to people of color. Born of the black white binary, that which is white cannot be trash, and that which is trash cannot be white. So the idea of a poor, dirty, heathen whiteness disrupts this binary of racial boundaries. Whiteness then requires modification, right? We gotta put an adjective on there or a noun, white, trash. Um, so unfortunately, the trash, the traits associated with an anomaly of white trash, you know, are, are hinged on, right, white supremacist ideas about people of color. So the problem about how to talk about the things that make up a white trash identity abject poverty, unequal educations, food insecurity, the destruction of natural resources, demeaning and demoralizing stereotypes, alongside of racism and white supremacy is complicated. Um, it's difficult to attend to the oppression of poor white people because we also recognize that they have relative access to a system of white privilege. Um, though this access might be mediated, um, so it's a struggle to have compassion for a group of people that are themselves exploited by a, a white patriarchal capitalist society, but also have participated in racism and benefited from the system itself. So for those conducting diversity inclusion efforts in higher education, there's an additional concern, concern that exists. You know, will the dialogue about race issues and hard-won resources for our underrepresented students, faculty, and staff be eroded or shifted to easier conversations, right? That of talking about class via terms like low income, first generation, or access and affordability, right? So there are consequences to those conversations. And, um, and I think some of those conversations occur because they're easier for whites white people, white structures, white systems, right? Predominantly white institutions. The other problem is the romanticization and ultimate redemption of white trash that occurs in these narratives. Um, if you've ever read the memoir, um, Glass Castle, um, they show, up, show us a recuperation of damaged whiteness through education. We learned a pity and champion, um, the likes of Jeanette Walls, who escapes her background with the assistance of college, pearls, designer clothes, a rich boyfriend, and eventually an esteemed profession. But as an adult, um, she's plagued by her tragic past, but she can choose to share it or cover it, right, through middle-class whiteness. Um, what gets lost in the romance is that one's uh, meteoric rise out of white trashness is through access to white privilege. Right, that's not what's discussed. Um, and it also perpetuates a myth of meritocracy and fails to recognize that the ability to access that privilege is very much mediated and local. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, my white trashness is relational. Uh, it's built on my relations to other people in my town. I grew up hovering around the poverty line, sometimes above it, a lot of times below it food stamps, utility shutoffs, evictions, alcoholism, gambling, mental illness, neglect. That's what constructed my upbringing, but it's what made me different from my middle-class peers. And that's um, really what shapes what whiteness looks like for me. Um, compared to folks of other, of higher socioeconomic status, you know, I was a different kind of white. And that gets talked about in a lot of the literature on whiteness as well. 
Um, so I experienced barriers um, in terms of my educational access as well, but this, these barriers were in relation to other, the other white students in my school. Um, my identity as a white person was stigmatized because I was poor, what people thought I could achieve, uh, where they thought, what college I could go to, right? So that lens, right, there's a lens of whiteness. Um, so these are the barriers we now associate with first generation and low income students. We didn't really have that language back then. You know, a lack of understanding for the higher education system, fear, inability to pay, and then all the personal baggage um, that pov of poverty that students bring. Um, so it wasn't really until I left West Virginia that I recognized myself as um, uh, an Appalachian and a hillbilly. That's what the rest of the, how the rest of the country saw me. Uh, my coworker believed I grew up without shoes. He was impressed that I had all my teeth. That was a good one. Um, and after being made fun of for the, the way I spoke, I learned to like adapt um, my uh, accent to more kind of East Coast standards of, of talk. Um, you know, whiteness is so homogenizing that with some effort, you can cover a white trash identity and cross the line to other more acceptable forms of right, whiteness. And that is what white privilege is and that's how it functions, right? Um, so I am bestowed unearned privileges based on my skill, skin color if I project the white kind of whiteness and then I can access that privilege with some success. Um, that I think my sort of, where my white identity is within white culture is what has helped me to be able to identify maybe white privilege more, more easily or willingly sometimes than other folks. Um, and then I think I'm about done here. Getting back to my friend's question, I believe that it is the experience of being stigmatized, experiencing socioeconomic inequality um, that made me more predisposed to working, to being in solidarity with other people. Um, access to higher education helped. Um, but here's what I'm not saying. Uh, being white trash is not equivalent to living as a racial minority. A white trash identity does not carry a devastatingly long history of slavery or genocide, but rather was complicit in it. And that's important. I don't believe I have common experiences with underrepresented minoritized groups. Um, rather, it's within the socioeconomic relations of whiteness that I have experienced being the wrong kind of white to other white folks. And that translated into a loss of opportunity and access, stigma, inability to negotiate power structures. Um, and, you know, my white, I guess my white trash upbringing still persists even now as a in a middle class life. Um, sometimes my accent slips, or I mentioned I'm from West Virginia, and then I get some really interesting responses. Um, the experiences of poor whites with inequality is very different from the experiences of people of color. Um, but I would say the machi machinery of inequality is not, and that's white paper, patriarchal capitalistic racist society. Um, so one can wash off the dinge of being the wrong kind of white, but the covering of white trash identity is problematic. While experiences of discrimination is relational within whiteness, the experiences of poor whites also create an opportunity to confront racism. So if we disconnect from sort of this poor white identity, we also disconnect from potentially the grounds of an experience that can offer perspective into what it means to also be subject to deficits. Again, within white society, not the same as racism, but maybe a ground for solidarity. Um, as my colleague indicated, I was supposed to be some kind of serious racist, you know, so how can we move away from homogenizing forces of whiteness that presume no possibility for allyship to instead find ways to build solidarity while still interrogating interlocking systems of white supremacy, racism, and capitalism. Um, so for white, white people, you know, our work, it looks different. And it, um, there's emotional labor, I think, that has to be undertaken to do that. Um, 
that involves not doing white centering when you're doing race work. And I think that's what I was trying to confront in this, in this paper. So rather than hide my identity, I try to acknowledge my roots um, and think about what racial solidarity looks like. So my students can see themselves in me, see other ways of living and think about other political possibilities. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. There is so much to unpack there. <laughs> Just beyond this, um, just so powerful. What I'd like to do is turn to question and answer around Dr. Childers' work. So, I mean, you heard the intertwined connection about studying the topic as well as her identities and identities as a scholar and a person, all all interconnected. Can I want to open it up for questions before about fifteen minutes or so before we turn to how this might inspire or uh, your own research as scholars. So let's start with any questions that you have. Please uh, un unmute yourself and go ahead and ask or use the chat box either way. I can go ahead and, and start if that's okay. Um, so I was really interested in hearing more about what you said about um, your whiteness giving access to stories that people might, might not feel comfortable sharing with someone else. Um, I was recently doing an interview where the respondent was talking a lot about how white privilege is not real and a lot of other <laughs> horrible things. Um, and I'm just curious, kind of in the interest of accessing that information, which I think is important to know and report, how do you balance feeling kind of complicit or feeling as though you're giving them like the sense that what they're sharing is okay, if that makes sense? Because mm -hmm. I, I tried to remain neutral, but I left feeling really icky as though I had contributed to him walking away, continuing to hold beliefs that sit really right. unwell with me. Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, well, so you, I think you have to think about like, what's the overarching goal? So if the goal is to interrogate those belief systems, you have to make a space for people to share those belief systems and they're not going to share them if they feel that you're judging them, right? Um, early on in my study, so one of my friends told me, my, or a parent a long time ago told me, I have a face that lies like a paper bag, which means, you can't hide, you know, you can't hide anything in paper bag, right? So I got into the school and you see a lot going on and I just noticed that my face was betraying, right, my mind. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that um, I needed to do my own emotional, what they call emotional labor, the work of getting myself right, so that when I got in there, I was prepared to receive. Because I kind of came to realize that those really hard discussions People tell you the things that make you feel very, as you said, kind of dirty and icky um, are real gifts, right? Um, because it gives you an opportunity to, to do a deep, a deep, potentially a deep analysis of why those things happen and how they can change. And we can't do that if people aren't forthcoming. Um, so I think you just have to get, get okay with being strategic. And I think when you share back your interviews, they see their own words in print. And you're not, can, you're not going, oh, oh, yeah, good, I agree. You're not sharing anything, right? You're just listening. You're creating a space to listen. But then when you come back in and do the member check, if you're able to share like an early analysis, what I found was when people saw their words in my analysis, so when those white parents that I met with saw how I was um, reading their comments, they were like, oh, I never thought about it that way. So I think reflecting people, reflecting people back to themselves can be very powerful. But I, I mean, it's hard to feel icky, but I think you just have to, I think I'm, I'm sounding dismissive and I'm not trying to be, but I feel like you just have to kind of put your researcher hat on. There's a really old book, it's called Research, Ra Racing Research, Researching Race, and there's a chapter in there by a woman who did a study of white supremacists. 
and that might be of interest to you to read. A another resource is um, the very available documentary whose name I can't remember by the guy that went in and interviewed the people that killed people in, um, I think it was Thailand. Oh. It got an Academy Award, so it can't be too hard to find, but he interviewed the killers. And right. then he had them, um, he put it into this documentary, but he, he did a series of member checks where he had them act out their roles. Ooh. And then they, they saw themselves and it actually shifted a lot of people's thinking in amazing ways and also shifted, then it showed in, in the country itself, shifted their sense of the history of that time. Mm. So there's something very powerful that can happen with just kind of going neutral and documenting and then playing back to themselves. In, in this case, particularly the horrors mm. of what they did and at the front end, their pride in the horrors of what they did and then this sort of changes that they were capable of going through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Murder in Paradise, Penny says, is the name of that movie. And we have a question regarding your okay. dissertation. Okay. Dr. Shielders, is, and it's asking in your dissertation, what did you find are the reasons that the school was so successful how is that the, the school differ from other schools? Um, I'm trying to think back. One of the things that was very impressive to me was there was a, a small group of teachers um, for whom the goal wasn't this optimal success, right, of test scores and graduate. Of course, we all want them, they all want their students to graduate. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but their focus was on getting students from wherever they were to somewhere else just farther ahead, right? So their definitions of success for these students were based on the students. They had a, a, just a great deal of compassion. Um, and when their freshman year, all the students took a class that was referred to as a boot camp. It was a social studies course. All students had to take it. And in that course, they basically leveled the playing field for every student. So regardless of where you came from, what school you, you know, feeder school you came from, um, you learned how to take notes, you learned how to read, you learned how to do projects, you learned how to interact with your classmates, you learned a culture of academic achievement. Um, so it wasn't a hidden curriculum anymore. It was an expectation. And it was, these teachers were like, and you all can do it. Nobody made an excuse for anybody. But what you all could do, you all can do it, and that it is what you can be, you can move farther down the road than you were when you got here. And they felt like that was their definition of being good teachers, was helping students just get a little farther down the road, whether that was making straight A's or, you know, doing the best that they could dependent on their circumstances. Not all the teachers in there were like this, but these teachers I felt really laid a foundation for their students um, that carried them through. So all these kids got there maybe thinking one way and the students I interviewed talked about the way their uh, how they saw themselves changed. Like maybe they got there thinking they couldn't go to college. They just came to the school. A lot of them came to school because they didn't want to go to a school where there was a lot of um, violence. But they came to this school and suddenly realized, you know, that they wanted to go to college. They wanted, they, they started to see themselves as I called them educational, educational subjects you know, they saw themselves as a part of the education process and not, and they were committed to themselves. And I thought that was really powerful. 
And so we have a follow-up question. In your dissertation, you use critical race theory. Mm -hmm. uh, which theories helped you understand race? Oh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the first name. Harris. Why is the name slipping my mind? The first name. Ah. Anyways, she wrote about whiteness as property. I thought that was very salient for this school in particular. Um, Richard, De so um, Kimberly Crenshaw, intersect, you know, I don't actually write a lot about intersectionality in the book, and I actually kind of abandoned intersectionality in favor of thinking about race very specifically. Um, but I, there were, and there were reasons for that, but having an understanding of intersectionality was important. Um, there are critical race theorists in education. So uh, Gloria Ladson Billings, um, Tate, James Anderson is a historian and he was a very important part of, uh, he wrote a lot about um, Brown. Yes, Cheryl Harris, thank you. He wrote a lot about, um, you know, the legacy of Brown, the way we view Brown and really the way Brown has been operationalized. You know, the history of black education in the US it's not something that we learn about. It's very important to understanding students as educational subjects is recognizing that I actually come from a legacy of a, of a culture, family, of a people that value education and value success, which is different from deficit discourses that get spread about them. Um, so those were sort of the literatures I based myself in. How did not having sports at that school help? or shape oh right. yes that's right so not having sports also i think shaped academic identity in a, a different way um particularly for students of color who um you know often say well at the time you know um i would have to go back and look at the literature i can't remember the names of the articles i was looking at but just the way it's like sporting identities you know michael jordan I'm going to be a basketball player, that kind of stuff. The idea that sports was your only way into success or even a way to get an education. Like these students, the discourse of sports was not a part of their lexicon. They could go back to their schools and do sports, but they, they, kind of, they saw themselves as students first. And then this school, beyond it being an academic high school, it, um, it was also a theater school. So the arts were really important in this school and it just gave students a different way to see themselves um, than what you may the way you would typically see yourself in a, in another school and it recast the school as um, academic which is sad right because then you recognize well if this school is seen as academic then are other schools not academically focused Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I just think that's a great point when you bring, bring up, you know, the academic identity. I remember growing up, went to a art school, but it was kind of a pseudo art school and a really a big athletic school. Mm -hmm. And we always, my parents always talked about how where are the prep rallies for the straight A students, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, where, where are the trophies for getting on the honor roll? You kind of get a little, you know, certificate, but if you win a basketball game, you get a huge trophy. And oftentimes we see that many schools actually promote athletics over academics. So I think that's right. a great point that we, when we look at how we're going to bridge that gap, right, and promote excellence and, and, and students of color academically, that the role of eliminating sports, right, does a, a, does a great job in, in, in focusing on that. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Sarah. Help me understand this white lens. <laughs> is this something that a white person has? Is it necessary? You can't not use it. Is it something mm -hmm. that a person of color can't use? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I don't. I think we're. Um, I think we're in a moment now where everyone should be interrogating their whiteness. I think we're start. We're recognizing that as a country. And I even think as a researcher, whether or not you're researching people of color, your whiteness plays a role. Um, and I, 
everybody would have to think differently about that. But even as teachers or instructors, uh, you know, whiteness is salient. I think it's something everyone has to, to wrestle with in some way. And then the other question about, well, you know, there are critical white, you know, there are scholars of critical whiteness that are not white people, you know, and there is some something to be said about someone from the outside of white identity, but who knows how white culture operates because it operates on them being able to um, articulate and I don't almost like excavate and display that because the problem with whiteness is that it's like the water we swim in and we can't we can't we can't see it even as much as we may try to interrogate it there are intricacies of it that we can't see so i guess i would say yes yes and yes or yes and no <laughs> Okay, and so we have a, another question for you, Dr. Um, Childers. Uh, so the question is, what work do you think that white people need to do in terms of confronting and exploring their definitions and performances of whiteness to where mm -hmm. white trash needs a white qualifier? White trash needs a white qualifier. I need to so I guess that, that is an example of the definition and performance of whiteness, but what work do you believe white people need to do to explore that concept to where whiteness has definitions and is performative in nature? Hmm. Well, so the work I'm doing over in the Office of Diversity and in Inclusion is we started building, um, I guess there's level or got to kind of come at it from all places. I'm not some, so there's a lot of reading education that we all self-education right reading self-education self-exploration self-questioning um not just through robin d'angelo right but through real i believe also through i think critical race theory is more now more important than is has always been important but maybe people will see the importance of it even more now um but it's something like we can't let go of for these other more popular. I think we've got to do like a both and. We've got to be looking at the foundational work and like looking at these new ways of interrogating whiteness. Um, I think it's academic and it's also personal. Is that what, did I answer your question? Well, what are some ways that you've done that with your research? as you've explored your own whiteness as a researcher? Oh, I don't know. I would say that like when I was in graduate school, like I recognized what my identity was, but I didn't talk about it because I didn't, I felt like that was the um, impediment. I didn't, I didn't want talking about my whiteness to get in the way of my research. So maybe it was work that I thought about on my own. It's not something I talked about as much. Um, and then I think now, you know, when I was working in Alabama um, with, and a lot of our, our students were uh, black students from the area, you know, you have to really think about the relationality of yourself and your students. And um, I think I started thinking, you know, I was in my thirties, I'm, I'm mid forties now. Um, and then being an administrator in ODI, um, which is a unit that's 50 years old and was an Office of Minority Affairs. And so um, the integration, I think, of, of white people doing diversity work can of, often be complicated and challenging to, to different people. So just really having to think sort of think about my whiteness all the time, think about the um, allyship, being an accomplice. But, um, you know, my work is happening in different rooms now and the people that I'm influencing, I think I'm still able, you know, we are at a predominantly white institution with a predominantly white leadership. And the fact that I have the educational background and the research background that I have that they don't have allows me to influence them in ways that other people couldn't. And that's been really, and I don't mean people of color, I just mean 
in general, there are not a lot of leaders that have the educational background that I have. They don't understand critical race theory. They don't understand. I'll be honest with you. I was in a room where I said, you have to say murder George Floyd and racism in your next communication or people are going to be very disappointed. Like influencing leadership in that way is the, is where I'm at. And that's, and some of it is because I can do that sometimes because I'm white. If that makes sense. What is your office doing with the federal government's recent edict that critical race theory and um, anti-racism training are, I don't know, illegal or won't be funded anymore or quite where they went with that, but what, what do you do with that? We're trying to determine if it really is going to affect us. And it's not clear yet. Um, so trying, not, trying to be, trying to see what, is that really going to impact us? Are they really gonna take away our federal funding? And um, not give it too much, you know, in, in the academy, you have to be careful what you give energy to and what you kind of put out into um, start speaking in a more public way. So it's definitely like something we're looking at, but do very um, internally. But nobody's, we're not, nobody's saying you're, we're not teaching any, that anymore. I mean, a lot of my work is around facilitating diversity training and the import, it's not all that's important, but there's, it is an important piece of the puzzle. Okay, so we have one more follow-up question for you. And so the question is, what are some of the ways that white people can, and that, that do the type of work that you're doing, diversity and inclusion, interrogate how they do their whiteness? Yeah, that's hard, right? I don't, like, there's no easy answer for that. <laughs> well, how do you interrogate being, do, being and doing yourself every day? Um, so I've, I, and some of this I think is about who, who are your close friends and colleagues? Who are you, who are you in relationship with? So I've been working with women who are scholars of color for I don't know, 15 years. We've written together. We're close friends. We read, we read, we have a reading group together. Um, and we've always been able to talk about these things, right? So when you are able to build a level of authenticity with people and, and then you can have these really tough conversations, that's important. Um, and then, you know, working in these spaces, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting that my colleague, we were actually at a conference or attending a conference together and she said, well, you're supposed to be a racist. I mean, that's kind of, that was probably, not everyone probably would have felt comfortable saying that, right? So we had the kind of relationship where she felt like, well, I can kind of ask you about that. And honestly, it's what her asking me that is what prompted me to really think about this a little, little deeper, right? So I do think relationships with people, you know, who are different from you, racially, class, sexual orientation, it causes you to really interrogate either your positions of privilege, the role that you play in that with that privilege, you know, how you perpetuate systems of discrimination, but also like, what can you do to dismantle those things, especially when you start to have more, you know, relative power, you know, in the academy. So it's going on for you in your research and in your practice behind closed doors, in front of yeah. closed doors, multiple places. Raising children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am going to share my screen again and uh, move to uh, the next slide. So we've uh, just had a great conversation and we'll come back to Dr. Childers in a minute, but I wanted to 
um, say in a second, I will thank her, but thank you all for taking your time to be here. We really appreciate it. These conversations have been really engaging uh, th throughout the semester. We'll keep doing them. And it's because you all have said that you wanted to continue these conversations because it impacts your research. And so Lori Patton Davis and I working with Pukari Lamama, who's here today, we're working on a series on apologetic educational research research addressing anti-blackness, racism, and white supremacy. So we have three alumni who are scheduled this semester who will be coming talking about their work as well as be, they'll be in dialogue with Lori and I about the topic. The first is D.L. Stewart on October 1st and as Bakari will tell you there are over 450 people registered so we hope you join us. Then uh, here are the other Qualab lunches that we have coming up throughout the rest of the semester, you certainly know where to go to find out how to register. The Qualab is a team and the Qualab actually has a student, grad student board that Bakari and Chelsea Gilbert are starting where you all can have input into what research we are looking at, working on research projects, as well as be bringing in guest speakers, as well as practicing your own research before you go to conferences. We also have consultation and all that, as you can see from our website, so I won't talk about that a lot. But um, we did want to mention uh, we're going to not go into small breakout rooms. We do every, depending on the people and the conversation, we do it a little bit differently every time. And this was certainly an engaging conversation with you all with Dr. Childers. So uh, we're going to stick around so that, you know, like when we're in person, we would stand in line and talk to Dr. Childers and have a little conversation. So we're going to stick around to do that. But before we do, I would like to say thank you so much, Dr. Childers, for sharing your important research, your approach, all of this. Thank just, you. Thank you. Thanks um, for having me. Mm -hmm. We learn a lot. I always learn a lot from your work, from reading it, as well as hearing you talk about the complexities that are going on for you behind the scenes as well. Uh, so. I, it's kind of weird to have it all quiet with thanking you, but uh, <laughs> it's just right. a different different day. But thank you mm -hmm. so much. So I, just due to time, I will let people go if you want. But if you would like to stick around and ask questions, please do. Uh, we would welcome that. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>